Welcome back to Medical Engineering. Today we want to spend a little more time in endoscopy and in particular we want to look at future developments and the latest state of the art in the field and how this may impact the surgeries of the future. So endoscopy part two and what do I have for you? Well the first thing that I want to show is a kind of set of tools that are assembled into a technique that is called natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery. So this is a kind of intervention program where you try to induce as minimum scars as possible. So you want to use essentially natural orifices like the mouth, anus and so on and enter the body through these keyholes and then you want to go ahead and do the incisions essentially in the stomach or in the colon in order to access the site that you want to actually perform your treatment on. So this is still in an early experimental stage but it is already allowed to be performed in humans and in practice is basically performed using hybrid techniques where you then use additional technology in order to help with the navigation. So you can see Nodes has a couple of advantages. You need less anesthesia because there's less pain through the stomach. Then of course you have even shorter recovery time. So that's another big advantage of this kind of technology and you don't have any external scars. On the other hand, there's also a couple of disadvantages, in particular the unsterile access points when you do the incisions in the colon and so on. So this causes a bit of trouble and second that you have to have very flexible endoscopes because you have no stable abutment and also the navigation can become very difficult. So there's lots of challenges with nodes and therefore you need then additional navigation and we will see that for example with 3D endoscopes later in this video. Another very interesting technique that I want to show to you is the so-called confocal laser endomicroscope, the CLE device. And this is essentially able to perform a, what is called optical biopsy inside the patient. So typically if you perform a biopsy, what you do is you go inside the body, you take out a small piece of tissue and this tissue then has to be taken out of the body, it has to be stained and it has to be prepared in a very elaborate process and then you get an image like this one. And here you can then identify different cells, you can identify cancer and you can really go into the cellular range and identify any processes that go wrong on this level. Obviously this takes a little long because you have to take out the tissue, you have to stain it, you have to cut it, you have to run the microscope and so on. So this is kind of slow but of course it allows you to get insights that you can't get in vivo. Now the CLE is a kind of idea to do that inside of the body. So this takes then views that are essentially also on microscopic level. So you will be able to differentiate individual cells. And this is a very exciting technology. So typically you have a field of view of about a quarter millimeter and then you can also image up to a depth of approximately 50 micrometer. So the imaging rate is approximately 12.8 frames per second and you can see this is why I already hinted at the device channel here in our flexible endoscopes. So you can, this is the tip of the CLE device and here you can see the light coming out. So you can see this small light here is actually where the imaging is done and this is the flexible endoscope where you're putting your CLE probe through. 
So how does this work? Well, it works the following way. You have a laser source. The laser source is sent through two mirrors and then through a fiber bundle in order to reach the scene. And then, of course, the light is reflected and it's returned over the two mirrors. Then you have the dichroic mirror and it is reflected here to a photo detector. So this way we can then start scanning and with these two mirrors here we can change the x and y direction such that we can rasterize the fiber bundle and sample all of the pixels in the image. This allows us then to produce images that will be able to show individual cells. So to understand a bit what we're seeing on these images, let's first think about what we're going to expect in the mucosa, that is the epithelium. And these are exactly the cells that we're interested in. And you typically find them in your mouth or you would also find it inside of your colon and the gastrointestinal tract. So what is happening when cancer is developed, the tissue changes from a normal state, as you can see here, to a small kind of swelling and then you get mild dysplasia, moderate dysplasia, up to severe dysplasia. And here you can see that the structure of the cells here, this breaks down. And when you develop a carcinoma in situ, the cell formation is very different and you get this very irregular structures because the cell shapes change and the tissue is breaking down. You have this swelling and the tumor growing. Now this can also be visualized in the CLE images and you can see this on the two images here. So on the left hand side, you see a regular epithelial kind of cell tissue and you see that you can still outline individual cells here. So you see the gaps between the cells and this is a regular mucosal epithelium. Now, if you have the carcinoma, you see that there is essentially no cell delineation. You just see those black blobs and then you see stuff like this one here. So it's very hard to see anything on such an image and this happens if you have a carcinoma. Now, interesting about this is that we can image this inside of the patient. So for example, if we suspect that a nodule is cancerous, we can use the CLE probe in order to investigate whether this is just regular tissue and will just disappear on its own or whether it's really a cancer and has to be taken out. Also, it's very useful if you want to figure out how much tissue you have to remove in order to have really taken out everything that is already cancerous and needs to be removed. One thing that you still should keep in mind when you are imaging with CLE, the reason why we see actually the gaps between the cells is because we are using a fluorescent dye and this is administered to the patient. And of course, this fluorescent has to go into the patient first before you can see this very neat cellular structures here. So there's also a little downside when you want to use the CLE endoscope, you have to use this contrast agent or dye. And this is why the imaging is also not so easy, but this kind of technology is already emerging and a lot of potential applications have been identified that are currently being investigated in research projects. Another very important topic is 3D endoscopy. And 3D endoscopes 
could be a game changer for very complex interventions like the nodes one that we've seen earlier. And here the idea is that we want not just to see the inside, but we want to get really a 3D reconstruction of the tissues inside of the body. So in a 3D endoscopy, we actually have a technique where we acquire metric range data, so depth data, like surfaces or point clouds of the surgical site with an endoscopic intervention. This range data then delivers topographic information about the observed scene. It can be acquired using different techniques and we will look into a couple of those in the following and discuss their advantages and disadvantages. So generally an advantage of the 3D endoscope is that it allows metric measurements because it's calibrated. We can then also measure distances in millimeter and so on. You get on top a mesh representation of the field of view and this then allows intuitive visualization so you can change your viewpoint artificially. So if you look from one side, then you can turn the scene and move to a location that is physically actually not accessible. So that's also a huge advantage of using techniques like this. And because you're metric, you could also avoid collisions and this is also very important for computer guidance and in particular for keyhole surgeries. Let's say you're operating on the brain and you don't want to damage certain areas, then you can couple this with a computer guidance, which then will avoid collisions with any tissue at risk. There's of course disadvantages. It's kind of early stage. There are already commercially available endoscopes around, but it's not used in all interventions. Also, you may suffer from specular highlights and sometimes it's really unpopular for surgeons. They're used to the tools that they have. They have the kind of idea in their head how they have to perform the surgery. And if you don't develop the tools in a way that they are so intuitive that they really facilitate the intervention, then also these devices are not so popular with their users. And if you build something that is not really useful for your user, then even if you put in all the latest technology and the most fancy stuff, nobody will use it. So this is also key when you finish your studies and you go on develop medical products, you always have to talk to your medical users, to your surgeons, to your radiologists and so on. If you develop something that is not of immediate use for them, they will simply not use it. So you have to build things in cooperation with the medical users such that they are accessible, usable and have user interfaces that will then also facilitate the actual treatment. Now let's have a look at one type of 3D endoscope and this is the stereo endoscope you can see here. This is a rigid endoscope and you see that now we have two optics inside of the rigid endoscope which allow us to build a stereo basis and with this we can then reconstruct surfaces from the two images. So this is very similar to what you're doing as a human with two eyes, you are able to perceive depth and can orient yourself in the 3D space. So these are some results, how the actual reconstruction then looks like. So here you see the reconstruction of the surface in grayscale on the bottom left and then different renderings and artificial views on the other three images of the same surface. One thing that you have to keep in mind if you want to use technologies like this one, you will need point correspondences in order to be able to reconstruct the surface data. So you need to find essentially small points and their corresponding point in the other image in order to estimate depth. So this is a key problem of stereo vision. Which brings us now to a short summary here. The advantages is that you have high definition endoscopes already available. It's certified and commercially available and it has a high range data accuracy. So the depth is very accurately computed and also you get color information, RGB and depth range information at the same time. Yet the range quality and range image resolution depends on the texture. 
So if you're imaging something that doesn't have any texture, like a white wall or a uniform organ, you will not get any depth information. So this is a huge problem. And also the feature matching is computationally expensive. So these are drawbacks of stereo endoscopes. Well, what could we do about the dependence on texture? Well, if there's no texture in the scene, we could just bring the texture in there and we can do that, for example, with structured light. So here you apply an additional light source that is able to emit controlled light, like the rings that you see here in this colorful pattern. And because we know the pattern and we can change it, we can essentially introduce a kind of texture into the scene that will then allow us to find point correspondences. And with this, we can then very accurately reconstruct surface data and you see an example here from a structured light sensor. Now a problem with this technique is because we are using the color information to encode the texture in there, we kind of don't get color information but only depth information with this kind of approach. Well, this is a prototype, there's other ways around it, but that's a clear disadvantage. Yet we get very accurate range data and we are close to independent of the actual texture inside of the patient. So this is a very useful tool, but then again, there are also problems with low range image resolution. So this is also one of the reasons why this is essentially a subject of research. There's people working on this, but this is not available as a clinical product. A third alternative that I want to show to you here is the so-called time of flight endoscopy. And here a different sensor is being used, a so-called time of flight sensor. And this is actually a type of sensor that comes from the automotive developments. So these type of sensors have been developed for helping cars to park autonomously. So they can be used, for example, to measure a parking space and then have your car automatically fill the gap in between two other cars. Now with this kind of sensor, you can acquire 3D information at every pixel of the sensor. And it's essentially done by sending a modulated wave into the scene. And this modulated wave is then reflected by the scene and collected by the camera. And because you measure the shift in phase, you can compute how far away the point of reflection was, which gives you an immediate depth information. So this is why it's called time of light, because you're actually measuring how long the light takes to the object and back in order to get the depth information. You may know these sensors because in the popular Kinect 2 Xbox whole body game controller, these devices have been actually used. And this is also something that many research groups have actually been using. So they bought the Xbox Kinect 2 sensor because then they had sensors that they could experiment on, or maybe not for endoscopy, but of course for many, many other applications. And that's a very inexpensive sensor. So today you can buy sensors like this one. They are mass produced for general purpose cameras and they will be around 200 euros. In this particular setup, we have the special light source attached to our endoscope. So we're using the optics of the endoscope to bring infrared light into the body. It has this special pulse format that allows us to compute the time of light. And with that, we get dense 3D information independent of texture. So very cool technology. And I'm quite proud because this is actually a development where our group has contributed quite a bit. So what comes out of this is an image like this one. So here you see this example. You can get the color information. You can get the surface information. One disadvantage of the sensor is that the resolution of the image is not that great. And the other thing is that the depth is very noisy. So time of flight sensors have very noisy properties and therefore you have to apply a lot of denoising techniques. And you can actually see that in the outer parts of the image, you see those artifacts here and here. So this is actually artificial and we were not successful in filtering this out here. Still, you get a very good image impression even inside of the patient in this area of the image. So that's pretty cool. Has been researched on. It was also a very nice 
project founded by the German Research Foundation because it has a lot of advantages. You have the constant range image resolution. You have completely independence on texture information and you get color and range information, so depth information in a single shot. So that's pretty cool. You get that at high frame rates as well. Disadvantages are the low signal to noise ratio. So there's a lot of noise in the sensor, which is kind of problematic. And so far, this has only been used as prototype. Well, what other developments have there been? And a key development is computer assistance. And this is also something that can dramatically increase the safety and also the patient benefit. And I want to show you a couple of systems that use computer assistance. So in the computer assistance, you generally then have a minimally invasive procedure and you combine then visualization data overlays in order to guide the interventionalist. And often this is then also associated to robots. And the robot then can be programmed in a way that it will not move into areas of risk. And because you have very good vision and you can measure depth information, then you're also able to steer the guidance and to put up those safety margins. So that's pretty cool. And actually in neurosurgery, this is kind of popular. And one of the devices that is being used is the Da Vinci system. So this is intuitive surgical system. You can see here on the left hand side, this is the interventionalists console. So you can essentially put your head in here and then you have controls here that allow you to steer the robot. So it actually has stereoscopic vision. So you even have a perception of depth. And then you can control essentially these robotic arms here in order to perform the intervention. And it is used actually quite frequently in neurosurgery. So this Da Vinci system has already been approved in 2000 by the FDA. There have been already 200,000 interventions in 2012. About 2,000 units were sold until January 2013, and it really became slowly a popular device, although a single unit, a single machine costs up to 2 million US dollars plus maintenance fees. There used to be a competitor called Zeus, but it was discontinued in 2003. So since 2003, it's essentially intuitive surgical that is running the entire market of those robots. It provides a complete 3D stereo vision and intuitive controlling. And the newest versions even add simulators with virtual tutorials, force feedback, and so on. So in theory, this would even allow distant operations, and it has been performed already in 2001. But keep in mind, latency is a key issue here. There has also been a bit of criticism. Um, there's high costs for the hospitals. The surgeons have to learn to control the system, but actually the running rate is pretty high. So people can get acquainted with the systems pretty quickly. A disadvantage is also that software is proprietary and cannot be modified. So if you want to work with these systems in research, you have to work with the vendor. So far, there's very little studies that have shown the real benefits for the patients. But the surgeons really like the device because it's really intuitive surgical. It's intuitive to use. And as we've seen already, there is no real competitor. There is only intuitive surgical manufacturing those devices. Now, why is the thing so popular and why is it called intuitive? Well, you have these kind of grips here where you place your hand and then you can immediately control the 
hands of the system so the robotic hands and the nice thing is that the magnification is done by the system so if you look into the system it will appear as that everything is approximately in the right size as you're used to it so you get very very quickly very intuitively how to use the system so use both hands to navigate the tools you have foot pedals to control the camera and you can even have a second surgeon to be connected with another terminal and then perform interventions together and a very very cool feature is that the units the control units they essentially have the same freedom as human hands so you can grip you can move around and if you play with the system already after maybe five minutes then you already get used to it so quickly that you can already perform first cuts you can move stuff around you can even try in a simulator and uh, let's say with some a soft tissue simulation you can do the cuts and then try to throw from one hand into the other and you'll f see that this is very very intuitive because it almost feels like a part of your body and in particular with force feedback it gets even more realistic so this is why the device is really popular with people who have been using it and if you ever have the chance to use one of those systems just for five minutes or ten minutes go ahead go to the simulator go to the experience booth at an exhibition try it out and if you have the chance to go and visit Johns Hopkins I would definitely try to get an experience with one of the systems there so this is really a great tool and I can definitely recommend to have a look at it it's magnificent engineering imaging devices and all the things have to come together to build things like that Okay, so let's have a look at a couple of future trends and a couple of ideas what might be coming up in the close to distant future. And of course, something that is around is fully automated procedures. But this is still pretty far away, in particular also because of legal issues. And it's the same problems that you have in autonomous driving. So who takes the liability? How can this be insured? There's really ideas around and people would like to do that. But I think this is still some time ahead. So automated procedures may not be happening so quickly. Other things are things like uh, real-time 3D reconstruction and augmented reality. This is really something that is close to being clinically applicable. And I think these techniques will still have quite a bit of impact on how you perform surgery. There's also ultra-thin endoscopes that might be a relevant development. Also nodes is a very interesting approach, yet the navigation is pretty hard, but sometimes you have to bring all these things together in order to make a point why you would want to go ahead with such a complicated procedure. And of course, there is quite a few benefits if you would be able to perform these procedures really safely. Data fusion becomes more and more important, not just the interventional data fusion like different sensors, but also with prior data like CT scans from prior to the surgery and also population data such that you can really build personalized models. And of course, techniques of machine learning and deep learning are on the rise and they will also impact the field of endoscopy. So finally, what is a very likely development is, of course, higher image resolutions and improved quality data. And there are already improvements on the time of flight sensors and there is super resolution. And I actually have a small video here. What can be done?
Well, of course, if you have any questions, then you can either send them on our learning platform, you can contact me on social media, you can also send them by email. And of course, I can recommend our textbook, which you can download for free. It's completely open access from the Springer website. And it's not just for our university, so everybody in the whole world can download this. So go ahead, have a look at the textbook. You don't have to buy it. If you don't like it, just delete it again. It doesn't cost you a lot to find out the website. Click the link and have a look at our textbook. Well, this brings us already to the end of this video. So you've seen the various future trends and new developments that are currently still part of research. Some of them already have been translated to clinical use like the Da Vinci system and are kind of a growing sector in the field. So you see all the new developments, they still change the clinical routine. And if you're a clinician, a surgeon, then if you learned your profession 20 years ago, you have to adapt all the time to know the newest trends, the safest surgeries and the kind of treatments that are most beneficial for your patient. So this is something that you really have to keep in mind in medicine this is an always changing field there's always new insights and people typically also like to contribute to these developments and you will find that many of the medical doctors they're very open to research and therefore it's very good that we have people like medical engineers around that kind of understand all of the technology but also have a fundamental understanding of the medical reasons, the anatomy, such that the interdisciplinary communication can work out. So I hope you liked this little video. And this is the last video about endoscopy. In the next video, we will still talk about optical measurements. And in particular, we want to focus on microscopy. So thank you very much for watching and looking forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye bye.